turn the audio up. Oh, okay. That's cool. Uh, All right. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. Right. Much better. So uh, we're going to give you some of the basics of, uh, of what you would do if you were to communicate with another Bitcoin node because uh, the, the, the Bitcoin technology, what it really comes down to is you don't need a gateway to go through. Uh, you can just plug into the network and start doing stuff on your own. Uh, there's an easy way to do it. There's a hard way to do it. There's a resource intensive way to do it. Uh, this is one of the harder ways to do it, but there's there's a lot more you can you can you can do with the network um, if you know details like how would I communicate with a Bitcoin node if I connect to it. Uh, if you don't have this book by now, please uh, I would I would highly recommend you get it. It's called Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, Today's lecture is basically chapter seven in this book. So if you go to if you go to this GitHub link, I don't think that increases. So it's github.com slash a a n t o n o p slash Bitcoin book, and you can browse down to chapter seven. Yes. I wanted to mention you can get that book autographed tomorrow at a meetup in San Francisco. You have that book. Now. That's cool. Meetup at meetup.com in the city. You know, I'm not sure, but it's on the stuff. Right, so you can get it, get it autographed tomorrow if you have it. It's at Bitcoin Devs. Okay, so chapter seven uh, on GitHub. Uh, this is. Is it chapter seven or chapter six? Ah, chapter six, sorry. Go to chapter six. It talks about the the Bitcoin um, network protocol that we will talk about just now. So there are some nifty diagrams in there. You might want to look at them, um, and you will cover parts of chapter seven as well. So if you have any any questions, you can always ask here and then revisit it later yourself. <coughs> All right, so. What are Bitcoin nodes? Uh, before we go into the presentation, I wanted to show you this uh, this website called bitnodes.io. Just do getadder.bitnodes.io, and you can see all the nodes that all the all the nodes that have connected. They they are not necessarily always transmitting data and, and downloading data. They're not they're not full nodes. They're just parts of the network. They may not actually be contributing to it. So this is what the current day Bitcoin network looks like. There's uh, there's almost no node in Pakistan, which which saddens me because I'm from there. Um, there are a few in Saudi Arabia. There are a few in India. A few years ago, this was this was nowhere near what it is today. So it's a it's a pretty nifty website to go and look at analytics. Uh, not really analytics, but but just the structure of uh, the, the connections that exist, or possible connections that might exist. Um, and if you want to target a specific node in, in a locale, you can go ahead and, uh, and get some of the data from here. Or you can just use um, the network itself and get the addresses and map them to a country or whatever. All right, so with that background, let's look at how we want to build a Bitcoin node. Uh, in this presentation, we will briefly talk about uh, the peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Uh, that is, how do I talk to other nodes uh, when I connect to them? So I can't just tell them to a node and say, hey, give me a block. Uh, it'll be like, just get out of here, it'll close the connection. Uh, so we'll talk about that. We will also talk about SPV, or Simplified Payment Verification, which is um, a way for you to efficiently verify your transactions. There are some risks involved with it. We're going to talk about them. Um, an important part of understanding SPV or simplified payment verification, bless you, uh, is understanding Merkle routes and Merkle paths. I think Ryan Charles last week uh, explained um, what Merkle routes are. We're going to briefly talk about Merkle paths, and um, 
for review, you can look at chapter seven, end of chapter seven in the, um, in the Mastering Bitcoin book as well. And then we'll talk about some of the cool things you can do once you know how to communicate with other nodes on the Bitcoin network. So, first of all, what, what do we mean when we say a Bitcoin node? Um, Bitcoin has uh, different parts uh, to it. There's, there's mining software, um, there's wallet software, there's uh, routing software that, that tells the node, I'm supposed to give this transaction to this guy, I'm supposed to introduce this guy to other friends that I know. Um, and then there's all, always the, the, the storing of the blockchain or maybe not storing the blockchain. So there are four different major parts of it. Um, when we say a full Bitcoin node, we tend to mean all four functionalities are present. So if you download the Bitcoin core client or the Bitcoin reference client, uh, you will see all four of these things implemented. You will see the wallet functionality. You will see you know, that it downloads the full blockchain and, and takes a few days to sync uh, on the Bitcoin main network. And you can, you can also run a, a testnet um, on it and, and start mining coins for yourself. So it has the mining functionality. In the early days, it was you know you could use that to get some some coins for yourself, and that's what people were doing in 2011, 2010, I think. Uh, and then there's the network routing functionality as well. So that's that's what we mean when we say a full node. Bitcoin reference client of Bitcoin Core is a full node. What is not a full node? The Android Bitcoin Wallet is not a full node. It is not a service that is offered by any third party. It is an open source. Uh, client based on um, uh, the open source Bitcoin J. So the full node is Bitcoin D. The, the SPB wallet is, uh, is based on Bitcoin J, which is not really downloading the entire blockchain. So when you load it up on your phone, uh, instead of downloading 20 GBs or 30 GBs of data, you're basically downloading about 200 MB or 500 MB of data, which is a lot better. Uh, and uh, the difference becomes more and more pronounced as, as the network um, grows in size and uh, both the blockchain and, um, well, just the blockchain. So what does the SPV wallet implement? It, well, it implements the wallet functionality, so it allows you to create addresses and send coins and so on. And then the network functionality, so it knows how to communicate with other nodes. And that's it. It doesn't need to do the, the mining or the, or the full blockchain download. Uh, and then there are other variations to it, like miners will use a specific part of it that does not have the wallet functionality, uh, and you can come up with some variations to that. So let's let's talk about the peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Uh, what is the peer-to-peer -peer protocol? In in the Bitcoin network, every node is treated equally, basically, uh, which is what we call a flat topology. Uh, Think of it uh, as the, the internet, um, uh, the, the IP addresses on the internet, they're basically a flat topology. They're, they're, they're created equal and they're treated equally and then we decide to give some preference or, over others and, and so on. Um, what are the requirements of a peer-to-peer -peer protocol? So if I were to create a network for myself and uh, I wanted nodes to, to communicate with each other without relying on a central authority, what would be the requirements of it? The first requirement would be they should be able to download data from one another. The second requirement would be they should be able to propagate uh, the knowledge that they exist throughout the network so other people can discover them without going through a central party. And the third would be if something goes wrong with the network, I need to send an alert into the network so people that are using the network know something is wrong so they can halt their transactions and so on, right? Um, we, the Bitcoin protocol, it does this. And, and the network that we're talking about basically looks like this. What we are really interested in right now is how these nodes communicate with each other. Right, so what do these lines really mean? How are they keeping the blockchain in sync? Oh, and they go into the network. How do they say, hey, uh, you want to transact something on the Bitcoin network? Well, I haven't synced up yet, so please wait another day or so. 
Oh, so I can I can sync up with the the Bitcoin network before I can reliably transact for you. All right, let's talk about connecting to a node. Um, how do you find out that that a node exists? Well, there are predefined sets of nodes which you will discover um, as you connect to the the Bitcoin network. But before you do that, you have no idea what the nodes are. Uh, you can use something called DNS seeds. What are DNS seeds? These are basically, if you if you go here and do an uh, NS lookup, so it says c.bitcoin.sepa.b. This is one of the seeds. DNS seeds that exist for the Bitcoin network. If I do an NS lookup on this, it'll give me a lot of IPs. Each one of those IPs is a known Bitcoin node that you can connect to. It may or may not be online right now, but it's most likely online. Um, and they've some of these nodes have existed for for a year or more. Uh, so they're they're. This is a pretty easy resource uh, if you don't know about any Bitcoin network. Uh, any Bitcoin node on the network. So you can just keep doing NS lookups and it, it gives you more um, more IPs that you can connect to. There, as we saw on get adder bitnodes.io, there are about 7,000 nodes currently on the network. And the third way, which is, which is now outdated, it used to be your node would connect to IRC, irc.lf.net and it would go to a random Bitcoin channel from anywhere from Bitcoin 00 to Bitcoin 99, and it would get a list of names that are on the channels. Each one of those names was an encoded IP address, um, and you could just decode that IP address, uh, decode that, that nickname into an IP address, and you could connect to them. But this is this is outdated. I think the, the network doesn't even exist anymore, irc.lf.net. But that's, uh, that's a cool insight into the history of Bitcoin. Now we just rely on DNS seeds and a predefined set of nodes. All right, so I know about a Bitcoin node. I know that I'm supposed to connect to one or two of these nodes, but, but what do I do? I can't just I can't just connect to them and start talking to them in, in, in ASCII code. Um, there is a specific way of communicating with these nodes. And uh, the way you do it is, we can, we're just going to talk about the, the, the broader picture of the, the types of messages you send and what the names of those messages are. We are not going to talk about the, the encoding that you use. It's, it's binary encoding, but it's, it's formatted a certain way. If you really want to get into that, um, pick a lang of your, language of your choice and, and go and look at the full node implementations of it. So in Python, you would have PyNode. In, in JavaScript, you would have Bitcore.io which is not the same as Bitcoin Core. Bitcoin Core is written in C++. Um, and then if you want to do Ruby, there's Coinbase's uh, Toshi. You can find it on GitHub. And there, I think, all these guys are constantly improving it. And of course, if you know C++, you can go use the Bitcoin Core client. So let's, let's figure out what you say when you, when you meet someone on the Bitcoin network. By, by someone, I mean another node. You send them an introduction to yourself. You say, uh, so this is the version of the Bitcoin protocol that I'm using. This version is specified by the, uh, the, the, the Bitcoin core client. So all the, the core developers will constantly make changes to the Bitcoin core client. And they will in, uh, increase the, the, uh, or change the, the version protocol over there. So they'd be like, yeah, if you require these specifications for a transaction, you will have this version protocol and they keep uh, the changing it, but made the changes. Um, so you will send the protocol version that you're using. You will send the, the current Unix time that you're using. Uh, you will send them the IP address, their IP address as you see it. And you will send them your own IP address as you see it. So in my case, uh, sometimes it, tends, uh, it, it turns to be uh, my, my private IP instead of my public IP, I don't know. If that's actually used or not, or it's just for just accounting purposes or, or whatnot. But we, we send them this information. 
Uh, we also send them a sub version uh, of the client we're using. So if you use a Coinbase's Toshi, it'll say uh, Toshi is 0 0.1. And uh, if you're using the Bitcoin Core client, which is also called the Satoshi client, um, it'll say Satoshi and then the version 0 0.9, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. Um, and then you will also sell, send them um, uh, the, the height of the blockchain that you have. So for example, if there are uh, 400,000 blocks in the Bitcoin uh, blockchain uh, and you have maybe 385,000 of them, uh, you will say 385,000, that's, that's the height of my blockchain um, because that's the last block I got. Uh, based on this information, the node can discriminate against you. Um, and that's, that's primarily what, what it's there for. Uh, you connect to a network and it's like, yeah, you just started thinking, I'm not gonna waste my resources. So if, if, if you, the best block that you know about is block zero, which is the Genesis block, you need to download the entire blockchain. I'm not gonna waste my bandwidth on you, so I'm gonna reject this connection and close it. Uh, and sometimes that, that happens quite a bit. Uh, and I'll give you a little demo with the, with the modified version of Toshi in a bit. If I forget, please remind me. So uh, this is a version that I, that I sent my introduction to the other person. And if they acknowledge it, the response will be version acknowledged, which is Varak. That is the, the message that we will receive. And then they will do the same thing on their own. So it'll, in, a, in a network diagram, it'll look something like this. So uh, you'll send them the version, they'll acknowledge the version, and then they'll send their own version to you and you will acknowledge it. Handshake done. So now you can, you can start uh, exchanging data, right? Connection established. I have es established a connection, but I need other people to know that I exist. So I, if, if this, this guy is lying to me or is not well connected into the network, uh, I don't want my own network uh, or my own node to slow down because of him. I need to connect to multiple nodes and get information from multiple sources so I know the current state of the blockchain, right? So I will tell them, hey, uh, this is my IP, and the way I would do that is send them an adder message. Adder, and then my IP. And then they send it to their peers. So. You send it to your friends, and they send it to their friends, so friends of friends. Uh, that's how far people can go uh, if they send uh, an address message. So now the friends of friends know that you exist, and they're like, yeah, I'm looking for a new node as well. So I'm going to connect to this guy who just joined the network, and, and that's how, how you grow the number of connections. Or they may not want to connect to you. Uh, so in that case, uh, you want to ask your friends, hey, do you know other people like us? Um, the way you do that is you send a get adder message. And the, the nodes, your friends will respond with multiple addresses that, uh, of the peers that, that they're connected to or they know about. Right. Pretty simple? Is there any limit of the number of peers that one node to or? So the question is, is there any limit to the number of uh, peers a node can have? The, the, the standard that they've set out in the Bitcoin Core client calls for about 15 maximum connections. Uh, the reason you want to do that, keep it, keep it low, is because the number of connections that can be established by a node, uh, it is a limited resource on the network. So you don't want to connect to all of the network. Some of us do that as, as infrastructure providers. We really shouldn't, but um, there is no hard set limit. It's it's just best rules to follow. The the other reason you wanna you don't wanna connect to every node that exists on the Bitcoin network is because you are destroying the decentralized nature of the network if you connect to everyone. So you're like, yeah, I'm I'm happy if I create a transaction, I can propagate it very quickly to the entire network. Well, yeah, but you've destroyed the decentralized nature of the network, and you're actually probably consuming a lot more resources on your own. It. The protocol works fine if you connect to uh, you know, even three or four nodes. The assumption again is that most of the nodes are, are honest. So if uh, we're, we're getting way ahead of ourselves, but uh, yes, so the standard is you know, 15 connections is, is you, you should be fine with them. There are some problems that come because of it, and if you want to talk about that, let me know. Um, 
the Minotaur was the end of it. Okay. Yeah? Right. So just something to point out about nodes. There's also bandwidth considerations because a lot of time in Bitcoin, you get a message on one connection and then you'll be turning around and immediately relaying it on all remaining connections. So the more nodes you maintain a parallel connection to, the greater your overall bandwidth requirements. They go up almost dramatically. It's one message in equals every other message out. All right, so the, the comment was, there, but there are bandwidth considerations as well because you need to propagate information. Now let's talk about propagating information. Uh, you want to download the blockchain and you want to propagate information about the blockchain on the Bitcoin network. How do you do that? You can't just send a block and expect it to be interpreted. There has to be a way to do it. That way is inventory messages. Um, I sometimes call them invitation messages. Um, which are basically INV and then block INV or transaction. So when you want someone to when when you want to know when you want someone to know that a new transaction or a block uh, has has been found by you or has been has been propagated to you and other people may not know about it, you send them an inventory message. Hey, my inventory has a valid block of this hash and then I see that message and I'm like yeah I don't I don't think I have that hash so then you send them a get data message uh, with the block of the transaction hash right the same thing with transactions I received a new transaction I don't think other people have it I'm like hey my inventory has a valid transaction uh, do you want it and people will be like yeah get data and transaction hash and then you send them the, the transaction data, right? Um, so that's that's basically how we how we transmit uh, transaction and block data on the network. Um, right after you connect to a network, mm -hmm. right after you exchange the the version and, and you introduce yourself to the friends of friends, uh, if you have nothing on your blockchain, or even if you have something in, in your blockchain, how do you know you haven't been left behind? Uh, how do you know you haven't fallen behind? So for example, in our case, we, we had a 375,000 block, uh, local blockchain on our site. How do we know no new blocks have occurred on the blockchain? I just connected to this guy. So when the block was introduced to these guys, I wasn't online, so that those inventory messages that they sent out saying, hey, there's a new block, do you want it? I wasn't there to receive it, so what do I do? I send out a get blocks message with the hash of the latest block that I know about. So in our case, it would be hash of the block uh, at height 375,000, right? So I will say get blocks and the hash of uh, that guy. And if I have no blocks, then I will say, and I will, I will, I will, I need to know the Genesis block hash. So I can tell other people, that's the Genesis block hash, that's the biggest block I, I have in my, uh, in my blockchain. Uh, can you send me up to 500 blocks right after it? So when you say get blocks to a node, it will send back um, up to uh, hashes of up to 500 next blocks right after. You send uh, you send the get blocks. So just so I understand, you, you know you mentioned fifteen. You on average about fifteen nodes that you can connect to. <coughs> what if those fifteen don't have the latest as well? So is this like a just propagating over time, and then it's just all kind of just connections together? So the question is, if I connect to fifteen nodes and and they don't have the current copy of the blockchain as well, do I just keep connecting to more people? Uh, odds are that won't happen. Uh, because they're probably downloading the blockchain as well, and uh, since you told them what what your the height of your blockchain is, uh, they know that if they receive a new block uh, and it has a height greater than the height you advertise, then they will send an inventory message to you. So they'd be like, "Hey, I have a new block. Uh, do you have it? Do you want it?" You'd be like, "Yeah, I don't have it. Uh, get uh, get data for that block." Um, so I guess my question is, is as, as the network gets larger, 
um, and you are a node that wants to transact rapidly, um, you don't want to get left behind, which is why a block or a chain or anything, you guys probably connect to all nodes because you want to get the latest, no? Um, the question is, uh, we need to connect to more nodes if we want more up-to-date information on everything that is happening on the blockchain. Well, as, as far as downloading the blockchain goes, um, with experience, you can demonstrate that about 15 to 20 nodes is is more than enough for you. Randomly chosen nodes. Yeah. Okay. Randomly chosen nodes. And there are 